Hey, how are you doing? So today's topic is nerve muscle physiology. So let's get started. So in today's topic, we are going to cover these all that are structure of nerve fiber, properties of nerve fiber, classification of nerve fiber and will end it with the neuromuscular junction. So now let's begin with the structure of nerve fiber. So now beginning with the structure of the nerve fiber, first let us understand how it looks like. Okay, so for example, if this is a nerve trunk, okay, so this is a nerve trunk and you take a transverse section. A section where you for example you cut it over here and you're looking it from here okay so you cut it and look from here and this is how a nerve trunk would look like okay so this is the outer part and this is the inner part all right so there are specific terms given to the layers of the various uh, the, the name given to the various layers okay so the first or the most outermost layer is the epineurium Epineurium is the outermost cover of the nerve trunk, okay, inside which lies the perineurium. Perineurium is basically a covering that uh, covers or capsulates the various nerve fibers and nerve bundles, okay. So obviously if it capsulates various nerve bundles inside perineurium will be the nerve fibers. Each nerve fibers is surrounded by endoneurium. Okay, this endoneurium is basically the uh, Schwann cells that are surrounding the nerve fiber or the axons. The axons and the nerve fibers, are, axons and the Schwann cells surrounding it constitutes the endoneurium. These endoneurium, consists the endoneurium, these nerve fibers are all um, clustered together and are kept together. Okay, so that is the function of the endoneurium to keep them uh, together, clustered together these clusters form fasciculi and these fasciculi are covered by perineurium and multiple such perineuriums are found inside a single trunk okay and these are all further covered by epineurium all right so that is about the uh, nerve trunk and its basic structure apart from this there are certain cells that are present in the uh, nervous system so basically depending upon the presence whether they are in the central nervous system or peripheral nervous system they have different names and different types of cells all right so beginning with the uh, various types of cells in the central nervous system so what are these uh, cells called that are present apart from the normal nerve fibers neurons and everything these are called neuroglial cells the basic function of each neuroglial cell is to provide support and protection to the entire nervous system. Alright, so in no central nervous system, the various types of cells that are found are astrocytes, ependymal cells, then you have oligodendrocytes. Okay, so these are the three types of cells present in the central nervous system. So astrocytes, astrocytes have a basic function of uh, forming the blood brain barrier. All right, so the blood brain barrier that is formed is formed by the astrocytes. Then comes the ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are present at the various ventricles present inside the brain. And these synthesize the cerebrospinal fluid. That is a protective function. All right, and then there are oligodendrocytes that have a function of uh, support and function. These are called oligodendrocytes because they have shorter dendrites. All right, okay, so there's one more present over here. These are called microglial cells. Microglial cells are called so because they are the smallest type of cells present. All right, so this is the central nervous system and the various types of supporting or the neuroglial cells present in them. In the peripheral nervous system, there are two types of cells okay so there are capsular cells and Schwann cells I suppose you all know what Schwann cells are the functions of the Schwann cells basically they surround the axon and they are protective 
okay so that's what these two cells do that they, uh, they are protective in nature all right so this is about the uh, structure of the nerve fiber and the various types of cells other than the neurons present in the nervous system so this was just to give you an overview about how it is actually present in the body and what is the slight and microscopic anatomy of the nerve trunk and now we'll move on to the second part or the further part of our ch chapter so now continuing forward the topic that we'll discuss now is the properties of nerve fiber so there are seven basic properties of the nerve fiber the first property is excitability what does excitability mean excitability means that the nerve fiber when stimulated is excited that is it's excited and it transmits an impulse all right so that is what excitability means then we come to conductivity what do you mean by conductivity conductivity is the transmission of nerve impulse from one point to the other point all right so conductivity again is of two types orthodromic and antidromic okay so orthodromic and antidromic so orthodromic means that the nerve impulse is transmitted from synapse to the axon whereas antidromic is the exact opposite that is from axon to synapse so but you must have studied that the impulse transmission is unidirectional but the antidromic becomes opposite to it and doesn't make much sense right so let me explain that to you when you for an example you stim this is a nerve fiber all right and you stimulate it in the middle if you stimulate it in the middle the impulse is transmitted along both ways okay so it is not just that it's transmitted along this way it's transmitted along both the ways but if the synapse is over here the response will be initiated over here whereas over here it will just go ahead and die off all right so impulse whenever whenever there is a stimulus the impulse is transmitted along both ways of the nerve fiber okay so to, if this is the synapse and this is the other end this is orthodromic this is antidromic all right now moving to un unfatigability so why are nerve fibers unfatigable so nerve fibers are unfatigable because there is no involve of the atp in impulse transmission all right so whenever there is impulse transmitted it's an electrical event that occurs due to the exchange of ions so this exchange of ions can take place continuously for a long period of time without getting fatigued okay so that is why the nerve fiber is unfatigable now comes a refractory period what does refractory period mean refractory period means is the delay in the time of stimulus and the time recorded for the first response so why is there a refractory period so for example this is a nerve fiber again you stimulate it the time that you stimulate and the time that you first record a response is different so there's a difference of very minute amount of time that is because of the time taken for the uh, exchange of ions take to take place and the threshold stimulus and the threshold to be reached for the uh, action potentials to be generated and transmitted further all right and that is about refractory period then we come to all or none law what does that mean all or none law means that if there's a stimulus of above threshold then a response is initiated and the response that is initiated is the maximal response no matter how high your stimulus is as compared to the threshold the response that is initiated or uh, elicited is the same for example if threshold is let's say 40 40 millivolts and uh, the and the uh, applied stimulus is of 50 50 60 and 70 the responses that are uh, obtained for 50 60 and 70 are all same all right that is what all or none law means then we come to summation so what we talked about right now was about threshold okay so what happens if you apply a stimulus that is below threshold if you apply it below threshold and uh, the response will not be elicited because the threshold is not reached so what happens if you apply uh, sub threshold stimulus continuously the response the stimulus is added up for example if you apply if the just i'm just taking an arbitrary number that uh, threshold is 40 you apply 10 millivolt stimulus no response is initiated but if you apply a 10 millivolt stimulus at a short period of time continuously like 1 2 3 4 so four times you uh stimulated the 
uh, entire stimulus is summated and you get a 40 millivolt it acts as like a 40 millivolt stimulus and elicits a response okay so that is what summation means now coming to accommodation accommodation means when you apply repeated stimulus over a very long period of time the threshold increases okay that is what accommodation means there is another term called adaptation adaptation occurs in the nerve endings of the nerve fiber the nerve uh, the nerve fiber accommodates and the nerve fiber endings adapt all right so these two are different terms and that is what the properties of the nerve fibers are so now moving on to the classification of nerve fibers there are various ways to classify nerve fiber that are either they are so they are motor or they are sensory they are myelinated or unmyelinated but the most commonly used are erlanger geyser classification these were two scientists that received a nobel prize in 1944 for their work on something known as uh, highly uh, discriminated or highly um, highly specific functions of nerve fibers were discovered by them for which they received a nobel prize all right so now what were the classification the main classification included three types of nerve fibers a b and c nerve fibers all right a type of nerve fibers are further classified into alpha beta gamma and delta so if we were to put it in order the classification is the first is a alpha then a beta then a gamma a delta b and c c is also of two types that are dorsal and sympathetic so c is of either uh, dorsal dorsal nerve root or sympathetic nerve root okay so the classification is based such that the one with the maximum diameter is the first that is a alpha has the maximum diameter all right it is approximately 12 to 20 micrometers okay and c the, the sympathetic uh, type of fiber is the smallest or the uh, smallest nerve fiber and the same goes for the velocity the velocity of the nerve condu uh, the conduct for conduction of impulse is maximum in a alpha and the least in c type all right so the so the exact diameters and exact velocities are given in your textbook you can go and refer for that it's not uh, really important for you to learn it it's uh, if you do it's good all right so the various functions of these type of nerve fibers are the a alpha type of nerve fiber it's somatic motor and that means uh, it's somatic motor and it carries proprioception proprioception means the sense of position all right so it carries a sense of position from various joints and to help us analyze our exact position in air all right the a beta a beta type of nerve fiber carries uh, sensations like touch and pressure all right then we come to a gamma a gamma carries motor to muscle spindle what does it mean so it carries a motor nerve fiber to the muscle spindle the intrafusal fibers of the nerve of the muscle spindle are supplied by a gamma whereas a alpha supply the extrafusal fibers of the nerve mus uh, the muscle spindle so what is muscle spindle we get to that in the later part of the video all right so then we come to a delta a delta carries pain cold touch these kind of sensations all right the b now come to b carries autonomic preganglionic fibers what does that mean so in the autonomic nervous system the fibers that are present before the ganglion are called b type of nerve fibers and these are preganglionic fibers all right then we come to c dorsal and c sympathetic so c dorsal one carries somatic sensations okay and the c sympathetic carries the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers we saw that b was preganglionic c sympathetic is postganglionic so the nerve fiber that exists beyond the ganglion a c type of nerve fibers all right so this was about the classification of nerve fibers and a uh, one more important thing the a b c they have some specific characteristics that is their response to either hypoxia pressure or anesthesia <coughs> all right so the uh, c type of nerve fiber 
is most affected by the local anesthesia its response to local anesthesia is maximum all right the a type of nerve fibers are most sensitive to pressure okay and b are most sensitive to hypoxia that means if there is a decreased oxygen content in the body oxygen content in the blood the nerve fibers that will be affected first and most maximally would be b type of nerve fibers all right this is important for your mcqs they might ask a question to you on which nerve fibers are maximally affected by local anesthesia the answer would be c all right so this concludes about the classification of the nerve fiber and this is the most common method of classification that is erlanger geyser classification there are many other types of classification but they are not as popularly used all right so with that we conclude the properties and classification of nerve fiber and we now move on to the neuromuscular junction